My message this morning is called Being a True Patriot, Knowing Your Enemy. Okay? What is a true patriot, you say? Well, a true patriot is a person who loves, supports, and defends his or her country and its interests with devotion. Okay? Now, as Christians, we should be people who love, support, and defend the kingdom of God, the precious coming. You've seen it in America. Now, God bless America, but I'm interested in our nation. We need to stay true to God. That's really, really important, all right? So, we need to honor God's values with devotion. As Christians, we're living in a world that's becoming increasingly hostile to God's ways. I'm sure you would agree with that. Authority over the enemy is promised to us as believers. Correct? Yes. But you see, it's still up to you and I whether you use that authority or not. It's available. Now Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 tells us this. For our struggle, and it is a struggle, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the will forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, with what is going on in the world today, we need to be prepared. We're in a fight of good against evil. Now as Christians we do have a responsibility to walk in the word and to live by faith. You can't wait until you fall overboard to take swimming lessons, agree? Okay? We've got to be prepared now. Every good soldier goes into a battle well prepared. Amen? Not only is he appropriately armed to defeat his enemy, but more importantly, he understands the nature of his enemy and of the war in which he's now engaged. Spiritual warfare is constant. You're in it whether you like it or not. Satan doesn't take Saturday nights or Monday mornings off, and he never calls in sick. You may. He doesn't. Satan's greatest advantage over the children of God is his consistency as opposed to our inconsistency. The devil has been our inconsistency. Now he's heard people declare things like this. Oh, I'm going to really press in. I'm going to do great things for God. That's what I want to do. But Satan sees how many Christians on the 1st of January commit themselves to being in the church, regular prayer, Bible readings, but they don't even last to the middle of February. True? It is true. How often have you had Christians make these kind of statements? Oh, I'm really busy now. I just need to take a break for a while. Take some time to get my head together. What's wrong with your head? Listen to me, it does not work like that. We can't take time off from life, from the battle between righteousness and unrighteousness. We can't put God, Satan, on hold. We can never say, God understands if I just coast for a while. He knows my circumstances, my hurts. He'll give me time to lick my wounds. God does indeed understand our struggle, our pain and grief. He does. But he intends for us to live in victory, not defeat. Amen? He offers us grace to be more than conquerors. And though God understands, there's one who will never make allowances for us. And he's the enemy. And his name is Satan. Wouldn't it be nice if the devil would leave us alone when we're going through rough times? Unfortunately, he doesn't. He always fights dirty. Satan sees our down, time, our down times as his opportunities. Satan marks our weaknesses. He knows every one of us, our weaknesses. 
whether it be lust, doubt, depression, or whatever. He waits patiently for a perfect opportunity. Then he plants the seeds of destruction into our lives. Now, our responsibility then is to be aware of the areas of weakness that have caused us to fail or fall in the past. John 10.10 makes it very clear. The thief, that's Satan, comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. John 10.10. Now, this is what Satan does then. He steals, he kills, he destroys. He wants to steal our health, our productivity, our relationships, our joy, our peace, our faith. He's a major influence beyond statements like this. I wish I'd never been born. I wish I was dead. I've heard people say those things, Christians. Many people, even Christians, have in, in, uh, entertained the idea of ending it all. But every suicidal thought is from the heart of Satan. Certainly not God. Now, it's his nature to destroy us. But God created mankind with a survival instinct. All right? That's his strongest instinct. Now, whether we say, I can't handle life, so I'm going to drop out with this, it's the same principle and it's the same spirit. Satan always wants to destroy us with sin. He tempts us towards sin with that seductive promise of fulfillment. For instance, if people are un unfulfilled in their marriages, they believe they can find fulfillment in the arms of someone else. However, the enemy has never intended to give us fulfillment. When we go outside the truth, of righteousness for fulfillment, we enter the domain of the power of darkness. Remember that. Our involvement in sin gives the powers of darkness permission and opportunity to work in our lives. When we enter his territory, his intention is to destroy our minds and our bodies, our character, our reputations, and our relationships. Satan's lure to destruction is very seductive and equally deceitful. That's why many people are involved in New Age. They're all looking for something. Why? They haven't found it in church. They should have. They don't know any better. They're seeking deep spiritual experiences and meaning in their lives. But God is not some impersonal energy floating out there somewhere. God is real. He's the creator of this universe. Never forget that. And he wants a relationship with us. You're special. Amen? We need to show others that Jesus Christ is relevant today. Very much so. And that the search for a transformed life can only happen when it meets the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Now people need to understand that if they consult the wrong supernatural source for information, they open themselves up to the power of darkness. Everything that's not based on God's Word and God's Word alone is darkness. Never forget that. All right? Any supernatural information or activity from God or from Satan, you see, if it's from God, it comes by the way of the Holy Spirit. Okay? in the name of Jesus, and it's always according to the Word of God. Other supernatural occurrences are an abomination to God. We've probably all been an abomination to God at some time. Not deliberately, but just by not knowing the truth, all right? They are wrong, you see, because God wants to direct, guide, inform us. Exodus 23 says, Whatever guides us is our God. Did you hear that? Whatever you're being led by is your God. Wow. And we are commanded to have no other gods before him. Okay? The main reason God does not want us consulting other supernatural sources is because he loves us 
and he wants to be our guide. Any other guide is going to take you the wrong way. Now it's promised in Psalm 32 verse 8, I will guide you. See? In John 10, 3-4 Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice. Why don't we just go to God? He will give us all the supernatural information and activity we could ever want. We can pray and believe that he will direct our steps. You should pray that way. He has never hurt nor failed anyone. You can place your trust in him. Now some people think that when they become spiritually mature, they won't have, have any more ups and downs. But if you look at a heart monitor, you will see that ups and downs are a sign of life. When it becomes a flat line, it means you're dead. Okay? And a lot of Christians are dead in their activities. Isn't that a shame? Christian maturity doesn't mean we have no down times. All right? Christian maturity is learning to handle the ups and the downs. All right? And how to turn our downs into ups. Praise God. So we need to learn to encourage ourselves and one another. Now, spiritual warfare demands alertness, a constant vigilance towards the enemy's activities. Ignorance of the enemy will not protect us. We must keep our eyes on God and without fear keep our eyes on the enemy as well. Okay? The alertness is much like radar. You understand radar, don't you? In order to have any value at all, radar must be constant. If the radar dish stops turning for any predictable period, evenings, weekends, Christmases, holidays, or when the operator isn't feeling well, we can be sure the enemy will strike that day. He anticipates our failures to maintain a constant village, uh, vigilance. You know, I'm sure you can understand this. Many of you have had breakthroughs with God, I'm sure, in your life, if you've been around for a while. But have you noticed straight after that breakthrough, usually the enemy comes in smashing in with something else, trying to destroy you, trying to stop you pressing in. Always. See? So Satan anticipates our failure to maintain that constant vigilance that's required. Now in our lives, there are three strategic areas that we must, all of us, fortify against attack, the mind, the heart, and the mouth. Number one, the foremost strategic area is the mind. Every thought that enters our minds has three possible sources. First, thoughts can originate within ourselves. Have you noticed that? Some of you had weird dreams last night. God created us with the ability to produce thoughts independent of any other source. They are our thoughts. Okay? Now, secondly, thoughts can come from God, but God basically speaks into our spirits. All right? Now, God can speak to our minds, but the main way God speaks to us is in our spirits. Whether we call it revelation, guidance, the voice of God, the gift of the word of knowledge, he does speak to us. Now, if he's never spoke to you, I guarantee you've never been in the word. Okay? Now, the third source is the enemy. The forces of darkness also speak to us. You may wonder how the devil could speak to our minds. While the forces of darkness cannot read our minds, they can put suggestions there. Remember when Peter argued with Jesus, when he said, is it necessary for him to die and rise again after three days? He was meaning well, but he was doing it with his natural understanding. And Jesus responded to Peter in a very nice way, get behind me, Satan. That's in Matthew 16, 23. Jesus wasn't saying that Peter had suddenly become demon-possessed. No. Peter was speaking out the thought Satan had just whispered into his mind. 
Most spiritual battles, guess where they take place? In the mind, the human mind. It involves recognizing when a thought does not agree with God's truth. The enemy loves to discredit people and destroy relationships. John 8, 44 says, he is the father of lies. And Revelation 12.10 says, And the accuser of our brethren. God is a creator, right? He created everything in this universe from nothing. Nothing existed until it was imagined, if I can use that word, in the mind of God. But he spoke what he was thinking. We are also created in the image of God. We're also to be creators. God has given us active imaginations. Now this wonderful ability can be a target for the power of darkness too. The devil regularly fuels our imagination. We worry. We're fearful of what we imagine will happen. Even though those things rarely happen. Many people are frightened of the dark. But it isn't a literal fear of darkness. Fear of the dark comes when imaginations, pictures, terrible things, things that are not real. When we give the devil access, he's more happy to supply the images to pervert our cre creativity. Okay? God never uh, intended our imaginations to be abused through unholy, evil reports. He gave us an imagination so we could use our faith. Okay? Faith is imaging what God has spoken as though it was already done. Did you hear me? When God makes a statement, it's like it's already done. You just have to agree, line up with it, believe it, and speak it. And act on it. Amen? Praise God. When we can see God's promises in our minds, we have faith. I've got an image in my mind this year is going to be a great year. Might not, might not be politically. Might not be in many different ways. But in God's way, we are to rise to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and speak God's word. And great power can come forth if we begin to do that. Not just to preach it, but all of us. In your circumstances, everyday living. Amen? See? We can see God's promises. I see them. It's in your mind. We have faith. That's what the Bible means when it says, faith is the substance. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Now many people use the term strongholds to refer to humanism, Islam, communism, and other religious institutions. But let's look at what the Bible says about strongholds in the New Testament. Now 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 to 5 say this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring in, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now in 2 Corinthians, strongholds refer us to the strongholds of the mind. These strongholds are built up in our minds through wrong thinking. Although unbelieving, depressed, fearful and negative thinking also. Two mental strongholds are extremely common today, and they are the thoughts of inferiority and thoughts of condemnation. Now, inferior thoughts constantly tell us this, you're not good enough. Hmm, you're not smart enough. You can't do it. Don't try fooling yourself. You'll never get better. You don't really fit in. You're worthless. Do I need to keep saying any more? You understand, don't you? Now, some Christians live every day of their lives with thoughts of condemnation. This is where the real battle is. 
Real spiritual warfare, being alert to every thought. Now the Bible says in Proverbs 23 verse 7, as he thinks within himself, so he is. Sometimes it says, as a man thinks, so he is. One of the devil's greatest schemes is to nullify the effectiveness of Christians who are genuinely saved. He disables them by influencing them to think wrongly. And if they've never really got into the Bible for themselves, it's easier for him to do that. Now, the heart, spirit, the second strategic battleground. Proverbs 4.23 Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Now this is speaking about attitudes and emotions, both physically and spiritually. The head and the heart are the most vital and the most vulnerable. A wound to the head of the heart almost brings certain death, doesn't it? Think about that. In a spiritual sense, our heads, our hearts are equally vulnerable and demand equal protection. Can you follow that? If you're not thinking right, if you're disturbed up there, you're not in the truth. If you haven't got it in there, you've got real problems because when a problem comes, nothing will come forth. Amen? Now, so we all need to stand guard with our attitudes, with the same diligence. Right? Ephesians 4, 26 to 27 say, Do not let the sun go down on your anger, men. Oh, ladies too. Do not give the devil an opportunity or place to keep the enemy from your heart, your spirit. We must immediately deal with wrong attitudes that are surfacing. See, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now that doesn't tell us we won't be angry at times, right? It just has to deal with anger. All the bad attitudes didn't just disappear when we were saved. Did you notice that? Some of them were more magnified. Hmm. The Bible makes it clear about our daily responsibility to manage life, make choices, and to correct the wrong attitudes. Okay? These responsibilities cannot be ignored because we are new Christians or because we're burnt out, because we don't understand for or for any other reason, right? Colossians chapter 3 verse 8 to 10 says this, But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. But put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. Listen, if we entertain bait, uh, bitterness right, over our circumstances, we are providing a place for the enemy to attack. Okay? Matthew 18. It's an interesting story. You know, there was a man, he had a debt. It wasn't a really huge debt. And he, he went to the master that he owed the debt to, and he begged him and begged him, please help me. I, I, I haven't got the money to repay you. Don't put me in prison, which they could in those days. And the one he owed the money to gave him forgiveness. Now it says in Matthew 34, 35, listen to this. And the master was angry. Now this is because this man went then and chased somebody who owed him just like a couple of bucks, you know what I mean? Threatened to put him in jail. And when the master that he'd owed money to, this is where we pick it up, his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his spirit does not forgive his brother his trespasses. That was Matthew 18, 34, 35. Okay? Now, people 
who've allowed a root of bitterness to spring up in their spirit, their hearts, right, their lives, are easy to recognize. Everything bothers them. They become angry, critical people. Everyone they touch is defiled. They can switch circumstances. Husbands, wives, jobs, churches. Amen. But nothing will keep them from getting annoyed by others who bother them. When a root of bitterness surfaces, we must deal with it immediately. Now, it's relatively easy to uproot a tree when it's just got a small root, okay? But when the tree is fully grown, the roots have spread so far and they are so large, aren't they? That can take a lot of digging and chopping. That's exactly what it's like when we allow bitterness and other bad attitudes to linger. Okay? When we notice that we are bitter towards someone, we must not let the sun go down before we have dealt with our bitterness. Okay? We must pull it out of our lives before it begins to spread and go deeper. Now, if we tolerate bitterness and rebellion, independence, pride, or unbelief, you cannot live in victory. It's impossible. And those attitudes are slippery slides downwards towards a spiritual defeat. How many people have been safe for years, but the enemy is wreaking havoc with their lives? Big percentage of Christians are in that category. They have problems in their personalities, marriages, relationships, because they're giving place to the enemy through wrong attitudes that they refuse to change. Jesus won a total victory by shedding his blood on the cross for us. But we will not experience that victory in our daily life walk if we do not deal with wrong attitudes in our heart. We need to choose humility, uh, humility as a way of life. Amen? Now listen to this, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 to 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering have been accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 9. We're all in the same boat. Do you understand that? If you never have pressure in life, you're not doing anything, spiritually speaking. Okay? It's just as important to deal with negative emotions as with wrong attitudes. Emotions are not wrong. God has emotions and he endowed us with them. With emotions we would live a bore, with, without them I should say, we would live a very boring life. Okay? The devil however loves to inspire negative emotions. 1 Peter 5, 6 to 9 gives us a way to deal with emotions and attitude. The first injunction is humble ourselves. Humble yourselves. All right? Now, what does it mean to really humble ourselves? It is choosing to be known for what we are in Christ, no more, no less. Humbling ourselves whenever we need is the key to living a better life. No one can live without occasionally doing something wrong. Okay? However, if we violate truth, we must be committed to putting it right immediately by humbling ourselves before God and others and repenting. See, humbling ourselves has got to become a way of life. It's simple as saying, I am sorry, will you please forgive me? See, we have a promise from God that if we humble ourselves, he will exalt us. 
1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. If we do not humble ourselves when we should, we are in, in, in effect exalting ourselves. Now, it's far easier to choose humility as a way of life. God keeps his promises and we should never fear humility. Now in dealing with attitudes and emotions, we're also instructed not to worry. We are to cast all our anxiety upon him, aren't we? Worry indicates fear and unbelief. Correct? We can't trust God and worry at the same time. Your worry is to doubt God's willingness and his ability to take care of us. If we don't allow those things in our lives, such as pride, unbelief, and fear, we have effectively disarmed Satan in our lives. We've nullified him. Everything that Satan does, his entire kingdom and his nature emanate from pride, unbelief, and fear. Okay? We deal with pride by humbling ourselves. And we deal with unbelief and fear by casting our anxieties on God and confessing God's word and his promises, thanking him for the answers and praising him for it. Peter in 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober. This is good for Australians. Be sober. It's often equated with not being drunk, all right. But one of the Greek meanings for sober means to be watchful, to be constantly aware. It's not allowing yourself to be under the influence of anything that would enter your consciousness of what is around. That's as long as we are being sober. We then can enjoy life to its fullness and be confident that the Holy Spirit is keeping us from danger. Listen, life is supposed to be enjoyed. Right? But we are on the front lines of a real battle where there is no warm-up or pretend time. It's a real thing. And I'm telling you right now, this year is going to be the real thing. The pressures are there. The world system is failing. It's not just America, it's everywhere. A virus has locked down the whole world almost. We're lucky in this country. You may not think you are, but you are. I heard the other day when the Spanish flu was on, Australia lost about eight, uh, 18,000 lives. The rest of the world were losing millions. Uh, you're lucky you live on a big island. Now, the next step given in 1 Peter 5 is to be on the alert. Be on the alert. We must keep our eyes open in order to recognize the works of the devil. Peter then tells us to be humble, to not worry, to be sober and alert because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeing who, 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 someone to devour. We often forget who the real adversary is. It's not your leader. Ladies, it's not your husband. We're lovely people. Amen? It's not your wife, man. Or your co-worker. Or your mother-in-law. And all the ladies said, Amen. Our adversary is the devil. Okay? He's the adversary of each individual Christian. Hmm. So don't be afraid of the roar the roaring lion seeking to devour God's children. But he intimidates by his roar alone. That's what scares people most. Satan roars, we jump. He roars, we get angry. He roars, we lust. He roars, we get depressed. Amen? He roars and we become rebellious. And we being guided by the roar, 
Are we guided by the roar of the lion or by the Spirit of God? See? People change jobs because they need more money. They marry because they're lonely. They move because they want a bigger house to make room for more things. People leave churches because they're offended. I've offended heaps over the years. Now when I get to God, I don't know where I'm going to be, you know. But we have to give an account. Oh, preachers do, by the way. But where is the voice of God in these decisions? That's what I'm saying. If we make decisions just out of emotion, I've done that sometimes, we have to all learn, then that means that God is not our guide. If we're being guided by the roar of the lion, moved out by our anger, fear, and pride, we will be moved from a piece of protection to a place where the devil can and will devour us. I'm still alive. So I'm fighting those things. We all have a fight on our hands. Amen? God gave us emotions, but we're not to make life's decisions on the basis of these emotions. We must be led by God, not by our emotions or the roar of the lion. There is a humanistic philosophy, right, that says, if it feels good, do it. Hmm. Listen, that is selfish. Anti-God is an anti-Christian statement. Spiritual maturity says no to ourselves and yes to God. Amen? All right, next one. The mouth, the third crucial area. How many of you know that words can bring life or death? You need to know that. Life or death comes out of your mouth. Our words can be vehicles of the Holy Spirit for truth, righteousness, and life. Or they become vehicles of Satan for deception, accusation, and death. So what kind of power is released when we gather to complain and criticism? All right? When words flow from a selfish or judgmental heart, we may think we aren't really doing any harm, but words are powerful, and our mouths are either wellsprings of life or death. Proverbs 18.21 says, now, never forget this, death and life are in the power of what? The tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. That tells me, if you're speaking life, life will be. If you're speaking death, that's what's coming to you. And it's not just death dropping dead. It's death in the normal things of life that you want to succeed in. Health, blessings, prosperity, everything. Your mouth is the guide to it by lining up with God's Word. See? Psalm 141 verse 3 says, David prayed this way, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Satan loves to inspire our words. It often starts with someone making an innocent comment about someone who is not present. The comments become criticisms, and criticisms become accusations. We really need to pray for him because I'm just sharing this so you'll know what to pray for. I'm not judging him or her. Yeah. But they are great pastors. But James 3.10 says this. From the same mouth, both blessings and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. Amen? Hallelujah. We can actually release supernatural blessings from our mouths. Or we can aid the enemy's attack on people. Our mouths can tear down what God is trying to build amongst us. Amen? Spreading negative reports is as the ten spies who did it in Numbers 13. And it makes God very angry. Remember, those spies were sent into the promised land. Now, you need to see it as a church. 
We've got a promised land, but it's the spiritual realm. And you can enter the spiritual realm by faith. You can draw down anything you want to prosper your life, your families, your jobs, everything you do. But you can also curse it by being negative and saying the opposite. And that's what people, oh, I don't know I'll get anywhere. You don't know my mother-in-law. No, I don't want to. See? I want you to get the, and understand. Our mouths can tear down what God's trying to build amongst us. Spreading negative reports like those ten spies, you know, they went into that, they knew it was good land. If you'd been in the wilderness for 40 years and you went into a land that had green and running water and things like that, you wouldn't be too worried about the people, would you? Hmm? See, it enders what the, would, uh, God would do for his people when we're negative. It enders you. It can enter a church. What we speak out as spirit power, it's negative or it's positive. You do realize that, don't you? The words which spring from your spirit can defile us and others. Matthew 15, 18 says, But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Now, sorry, say, oh, well, I didn't mean that. Well, that's what's in your heart, you see. You need to clean up. And they defile the man. Ladies, too. If we constantly watch over our minds, hearts, and mouths, we will deny the devil access to our lives and then truly begin to experience victories. Amen? Now, in every army, there are good soldiers and not so good soldiers, correct? There are soldiers who win battles and they conquer enemy territory. And there are soldiers who fail and lose ground. Now as the church, we're in the army of God, right? We should want to be good soldiers for the Lord. Don't you want to be? Really, come on. I want to drive the devil back and advance the kingdom of God. And this is a great opportunity this coming year for all of us in different ways and aspects to do that. We need to get committed to the word of God and do what God tells you. And we will all be ready to go on the offensive. You know, over the years I've noticed when there seems to be some strife or rumors of wars or something, people want to run to the mountains, go in caves, hide themselves. That's the time to show yourselves. Amen. Amen. We've got to be ready for the offensive. We need to get on the offensive this year, not next year. Not when things change. We're the changers around here. See, we would not be in the position, I'm talking the church worldwide, that it's in if we'd have been advancing all the time. Like the early church, they didn't have the media and everything else. In two years, the whole world knew about them. Because they went forth with signs and wonders. Not just the apostles, not just the sacred twelve, but all of them. One who was a murderer, terrible, imprisoned prisoners, had them killed, became the greatest evangelist in the world. He became so good, God gave him two-thirds of the Bible to write in the New Testament. And he never once had worshipped and walked with Jesus like the others did. That should tell you something. If you read the true stories of all the great men of God, David, a lot of them, they committed murder or had it done. They all did things that you've never done, I hope. <laughs> Amen. Well, what am I saying? Can't you see every one of you have the potential, if you open your hearts and your lives to God, to do whatever God wants you to do? And that's the truth. We've got to be ready to go on the offensive this year. Do what God has called us to do, corporately. Amen? We've got to advance the kingdom of God. We've got to become true patriots for God. Patriots for God. Amen?